<laughs> hey, I'm going to jump into the word with you guys here. And, and there is more to come on that next week, unless you think, oh, we're just sending kids. No, next week we have some of the some of the adults that, that will share with us as well about their experience. I think um, we're looking forward to that. So some of you guys, like, you're thinking, okay, when, when do I get to go? All right, we'll let you know. We'll let you know. Right? Your, your time is coming. All right, open up in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2. We've been walking through this uh, series that we just open up the Word. We're digging into it. This is what we like to do here. We like to read the Word, talk about what it means, and uh, how to apply it to our lives. And we always like to engage around it um, as well during our church time. So it's not just come and hear and watch and leave, but it's actually let's, let's connect with one another. Before we jump into the, reading the Scripture, though, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about your experience, your favorite team, your favorite workplace, the, the best experience with friends, your favorite dating relationship. No, don't think about that one because it might not be the one you're in. Um, the, the, your favorite like experience with a, a group of people from the past. I want you to think of that time and then and maybe like one sentence. Tell somebody next to you, you know, your table there, what made that such a good experience. If you're going to say in one sentence, don't tell the whole story, just what made that so good? That relationship, that team, that group, whatever it is, that church, workplace. Now, go. <laughs> go. Say it. Right now. Say it. What was good? Like my dance. But you're supposed to describe a specific situation. No, no, you just say what's good about that situation. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mine was close to this, this like my demons. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right, one, remember, one sentence, one sentence. Not the story, just the, hey, I was part of this team, and this is what I did. Oh, yeah, so you got to jump in early. I know, I know. I don't know. Um, Celebratory ad. Okay, okay. So we gave you guys opportunity there. You're going to get back and talk to some of your favorite people in just a few moments as well. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We're going to put it on the screen and let's read it out loud and loudly together. Fill this place with the word of God. It says this. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. So we've been kind of breaking this down and looking at it from different angles. The early church here, they continued steadfastly. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. I want to highlight that word fellowship up there. It's a Greek word koinonia. Maybe you've heard about koinonia before. Koinonia, and this is what it means. It means a sharing, a unity, a close association, or a partnership. It's a participation, this communion and brotherhood. This is the unity that is brought about by the Holy Spirit. So they were experiencing a unity brought about by the Holy Spirit, and they were committed to that unity. In Koinonia, the individual shares in common an intimate bond of fellowship with the rest of the Christian society. It cements the believers to the Lord and to each other. So they were experiencing the glue that connected them to the Lord and to each other. And they were committed to that. They were devoted to that. There was something about this fellowship that took it uh, beyond the fact that I'm a member of an organization. I'm a member of a church or I'm a member of that group. But there is something much deeper than that. And this was life changing for them. Some of you guys named maybe workplaces where you said, man, we had this best, best group that I worked with. And, and the reason why was because we got along well together. Or maybe you're part of a team and, and man, it just seemed like we, we knew how to work with each other so well. Maybe there was just a friend group that you had growing up and you're like, you know, we just laughed so much. We had so much joy together. This is all of that and much deeper. This fellowship that they had was much deeper. If there was a unity that was in the heart. So some of you may have said like-minded. We were we had a common purpose. Anybody say something like that? We we're going after the same things or we thought the same. Some of you said, like, man, we got along well with each other. Whatever that is, uh, that's a taste of what these guys were experiencing, but it's so much deeper. And this is what God was forming the church around is this koinonia. Fellowship, this unity that is brought about by the Spirit. This is what I believe. There's an anointing, 
a, which is a special grace that sets you apart for something on unity. There's an anointing on unity. So we use that word anointing, this Christian word, if you're newer to it, what does that mean? And the anointing, it really means in the Hebrew, it's like the smear. There's a smearing on you. But what would happen is they would pour oil and smear it on like the priest when they're saying, well, I am anointing you to become the priest. You weren't the priest, now you are the priest. And this anointing is signifying that there's a change of season for your life. There is an anointing for the king. You weren't the king, now you are the king. And we are acknowledging that with this anointing. The pouring on of oil indicates this, that you are now the king. It is setting you up for a different season, a different calling, a different capacity, something new in life. In Psalm 133, starting in verse 1, it talks about... The anointing that comes from unity, the blessing or the grace, that special grace that sets you apart for something. It says, how, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So it's good and it's pleasant when there's unity. Have you ever worked in a place where there's disunity? Have you ever been in relationships or friendships or marriage or you know, something oh. where there's disunity? That is ne neither good nor pleasant, right? When you have unity, though, it's good and pleasant, and you can see it. He says, behold, see it. See how good it is. He says this. It is like the precious oil. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, which is why I grew mine for you today. The beard of, of Daniel, uh, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Well, who was Aaron? Aaron was a high priest. He is the one that represented the people to the Lord. He went in before the Lord on behalf of the people, and it says it's like this oil that anointed him for his calling. And when there's unity, that, that the people dwell together, when we dwell together in unity, there is an anointing on that that brings us before the throne of God. There's something about unity that allows the church to uh, entertain the presence of God. If you've ever been a part of a church that is, where it's full of disunity and division, you know this. Man, I don't think God's around here. It's like, he's outside. I'll, just, I'll wait outside for you guys. Like, like disunity, and God does not dwell in the midst of disunity. But maybe it's better to say this. People in disunity, when, when we're in disunity with, with, with the Lord, with others, we don't really dwell in the presence of the Lord either. Because there's something that... That just is a fight on the inside of resistance and hesitation. And God is saying, no, 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 no. I don't want that for me. <laughs> I don't want it for you. I want there to be unity. I want this blessing to be on you. I believe this. I believe that the unity of the church is a prophetic statement to the world. And I believe this, especially in our time right now where we are so divided, where everyone's so, their fuse is so short. You say the wrong thing in the wrong way, and they will explode at you, even if you agree with the same thing, but you said it wrong. It's like we, we are so ready to fight. There is so much polarization and division in the world, and we as Christians are called to be a prophetic statement against that, not by coming and saying, we're against your disunity. We're against you guys who are against us. You know, that's not, that's not uh, the prophetic word, the prophetic statement. Statement is this Jesus wants to use the unity of the church as a message to the world You see we have something that pulls us together that goes above the politics the social issues above all these other You know your, your team sports or whatever it is. We have a king We have a king we have a, a common God. We have a, a Lord, a Savior, a common experience of salvation. We have someone who is above all of that that brings us together we, there is there is uh, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We all have a common process to access God, and it's through Jesus alone. And this is one of the things, and the primary thing that unifies us, that's, and it sets us apart. Unfortunately, the church doesn't always, when I say the church, I mean the big C, uh, you know, historically, we have not always been in unity. We've not always fought for unity. Fight for unity, that seems like fight for unity. No, you have to. There's a battle for your unity. There's a battle for it because uh, the enemy knows if he can keep us divided, boy, we're going to be very ineffective in advancing the kingdom of God. There are people who would 
who would complain and criticize these guys for sending their kids out into the mission field at a young age. Oh, they're risking their lives. You know, what about the people around here? You got neighbors that don't know Jesus. Why are you sending them around the world? Well, go talk to your neighbor. Yeah. Cheer these guys on for answering the call of God in their life. Celebrate them. Let, let's, let's encourage one another and, and be in it together. Man, you're doing your part. I'm doing my part. There's, there's, I don't need to criticize you for not doing my part. It's so, it's so crazy how disunity can work. And yet when unity works, it's powerful. What did that unity look like? In Acts chapter 2, verse 43, it says, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. There is miraculous power available when we're in unity. We are believing God together. We are experiencing the presence of the Lord. We are grabbing hold of the word of God. We are expecting to see it come to pass. Many signs and wonders are being done. And it says this, Now all who believed were together, and all had all things in common. Let's just pause right there. They were together. Sometimes we have to pause and say, are we together in this? Are we together in this? Are we going after the things of God? Are we pursuing God's purpose for our generation? Are we all in this together or not? Because if we can be in this together, we can see this kind of stuff happen. If we're in this together, we can see the nations changed. If we're in this together, we can see that Palestinian kid who has hatred in his heart because he lost his brother in this, in this war that we don't all understand. And yet somehow he can experience the grace and forgiveness of himself and even forgive others through Jesus. When we're in this together, what can happen in your family? When we're in this together, what can happen in your neighborhood? What can happen as, as we come together and our churches then are in this together? What can happen? See, they were all in this together. They were all together, and they had all things in common. That's uncommon, <laughs> to have all things in common. Well, surely they didn't have all things. Oh, you wear socks? Ten and a half? I wear ten and a half. You like pizza? I like pizza. You know, that's not what they had in common. You, you think you like Rome? I like Rome. No, that's, that's not what they all had in common. They probably had a lot of uh, disagreements on how they see things and how they see life, but yet there's something that says, but... But there's some, something greater than all that. There's something more important, more, more eternal, but more lasting. They were all together. They had all things in common. Verse 45. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Listen to this. That is supernatural. You can't force that. By the way, some people say, well, you know, here you go. It's an example. The Bible promotes socialism. No, it doesn't. That's not socialism. That's not capitalism. That's kingdom generosity. That's kingdom transformation. This, they are free to give. They are free to say, oh, God has provided for me. Let me be a blessing to you. You need something? Let me help you out. I will drop everything to help you. You call on me whatever I have. I will, I will use it for you. Do you have someone in your life like that? What are they? Do you have their number? No, I'm not saying to share it with me. I'm saying, do you have someone in your life like that? Do you? Because you should. And are you some? And someone's phone, you're that person. You should be. You should be. Who, if you needed to go right now, hey, I got I, I to catch a flight, but it's in San Francisco. Who can you call right now who will say, yeah, I'll, I'll take you. Right now, I'll, we'll go. Who can, who can do that? Who will do that for you? Well, so-and-so, you know, I'd ask them, but they got to work. Who would say, you know what? I'm going to tell my boss that I, I got I to gotta go. I'm talking about this, man, whatever I have is yours. I, I'll lay my life down for you. There is something about that, that's, that, that unity of heart, that togetherness right there that they're experiencing. They had all things in common. They, they divided them among any uh, of all as any had need, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. This unity caused them to have favor with all the people so that many people were added to the church. They were, they were giving their lives to Jesus. They saw this prophetic statement of the love, the devotion, the commitment, the transformation they had as a result of who Jesus was and the fellowship that they had with one another. I think that that is attractive to people. There are people who would say, man, I, I, I don't even know if I believe in like your old church doctrine, gospel stuff, but what you have, 
I believe in that. I want that. How do I get it? Oh, well, come on over. Let me tell you. Let me tell you how we got it. It's not because we're really nice people. It's not because we, you know, seven habits to a healthier friendship. <laughs> you know, those things are awesome. Be nice and, crap, you know, improve yourself. But it's deeper than that. It's a, it's a work of God that comes from a heart surrendered to Jesus that places trust in him. And we're people who are committed to it. So here's the question. How do we get that? How do we maintain it? How do we get that kind of fellowship and unity acquainted in? How do we maintain it? Well, over the past couple of weeks, we, we talked about two major parts of this. First of all, the word. Second is the spirit. The word of God. These guys were committed to the word of God. Remember, they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. So they were regularly in the word of God. They were being taught and they were talking about it with one another. They were in the word regularly. They wouldn't have had the Bible in their hands like we have today. They didn't have access to that. We have that. That's a huge step forward. But they had the word of God. They were memorizing it. They're talking about it. They're discussing it. They're listening to, to Apostle Peter's podcast every Wednesday when it's released. You know, whatever. They, they were in it. These guys were not simply in the word, dissecting the word. And trying to break it all down and do all this. They actually had the word dissecting them. Yeah. Remember the scripture says they were cut to the heart. Yeah. They were cut to the heart by the word of God. You see, there are people who know a lot about the Bible. They can dissect it, but it isn't dissected them. You remember in high school, you dissect the frog and then you pull out the parts and you examine them. And yeah, they're parts, but there's no life. And that's what uh, dissecting the word of God without the spirit is like. You, you, you miss the life. And so not only did they have the word of God, by the way, at the gathering place, we're committed to the word of God. You want to know what we believe? We believe this is true. We believe that it's inspired by God. We believe that it's authoritative. We believe that it means what it said. We don't go back and say, you know, back then what, what they said, but now we see and all this. We don't do that. We believe that God meant it when he said it and it stands for eternity. So I'm saying, would you believe the Bible is, is, is literal? Uh, let me tell you something. Anyone who says that they, they interpret the Bible literally, they don't know what they're talking about. Amen. No one interprets the Bible literally. The Bible is full of different genres. For example, some of you are like scared. What kind of church is this? Honey, grab the kids. Like, <laughs> no. What I mean is when Jesus says, I'm the door, that's figurative in speech. No one translates that or interprets it literally. And Jesus isn't like, no, seriously, I am the door. Here's a hinge, here's a hinge. That's not a belly button, that's a keyhole. I am the door, <laughs> literally. No, figuratively, he's the door. He's the entry point into heaven. So what I'm saying is the Bible is full of prose. It's full of poetry. It's full of prophecy. It's got a play written in it. It's got history. It's got doctrinal teaching. It's got uh, other stuff that I'm not even thinking of right now. You know, just history. It, it, it's, it has things that are... It's got parables. It's got stuff that is literal. You translate it like when he says, I'm the door. He's not saying, I'm literally a door. But when he says, thou shalt not murder, he is saying, thou shalt not murder. <laughs> we translate that literally. We interpret it literally. And so we don't pick and choose. Like, well, that one's literal. That one's not literal. You know, you look at it based on the genre of how it's being written. That's how you approach the word of God. We believe that. And but let me tell you something. We literally believe it's true. We literally believe God is right. We literally believe that we will be accountable for what it says, even if our culture says, no, 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 we don't see it that way, that's archaic. We literally believe this. And there are things in culture that are very much in conflict with this, and sometimes they even sound nicer than some of this stuff. And, and niceness isn't what cuts it, because I'm not standing before the Lord based on niceties. I'm standing before the Lord based on his truth. He's, he's the judge. I'm the one to, who is accountable to him. He's not accountable to me or my thoughts or feelings or my culture. So at the gathering place and as Christians, we believe the word of God. We believe that's a starting point. But the second part is these guys were filled with the spirit of God. They had experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They experienced this this. Uh, the, the, the spirit coming on them and transforming them internally, spiritually, not just a new way of seeing things or thinking, but they became a new person spiritually alive. When they had the spirit of God come on them, 
on the inside of him. That's not an empowerment. It's a person. He's a person who came and dwelt within each and every one. The same God, the same Holy Spirit is now in everyone at this table and everyone at this table and everyone in those chairs, everyone at those tables, the same one Holy Spirit. And that unifies us. We become one with him. And that means that we belong to one another as well. There's a unity that happens. Now, the word of the spirit is how we get it. Right there, uh, Philippians 2.2 says, Make my joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love. We have the word and the spirit, right? The heart. It says, being one in spirit and one of mind. And so there's this constant work of the word of God that helps us to be of one mind. And the spirit of God on the inside, man, he takes those seeds of the word. He makes them come alive. We become one heart. We become one heart. And that's how we make it. That's how we get it. That's how we maintain it. But there's other ways that we get it and maintain it. Fellowship. Our attitudes and behaviors. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, it says, Therefore I, a prisoner, of the, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. And let's pause right there. It says, I'm begging you, lead, live a life worthy of your calling. There are people who live way beyond their calling. You are a member of the royal household, and you're dumpster diving. And you're proud of your dumpster diving, man. You like your trash. You like your garbage. You look down on people because they're in those garbages over there. My garbage is better than your garbage. My trash is better than my trash tastes because I'm fine with this trash. There's plenty of trash for me. Look, there's more trash. I can, I can get it on TikTok. All kinds of trash that I follow here. There's all kinds of ways that we, we live beyond our calling and what he's saying here is is you're not called to be dumpster diving you're actually called to as a member of the household of god you have authority you have a righteousness that comes from him you have access you have power you have grace you have freedom you have liberty all of these things belong to you you have a joy a kindness a gentleness a humility a graciousness all of that belongs to you as a child of the king live that way Live worthy of the calling with which you were called. Worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always, now these are attitudes and behaviors that help maintain unity. Always be humble and gentle. If you're wondering, okay, when are you going to tell me? How do we maintain it? Right there. Be humble. Be gentle. Well, you know, I just tell it like it is. Well, stop. Stop telling it like it is. Be humble and gentle. Well, you know, they don't know it. I need to let, make sure they know. Okay. You can tell them the truth and love, but be humble and gentle. Uh, it is not a gift or grace of God to be a jerk. No one has that gift in this. You know, it's just who I am. No, it might be who you are, but, but you need a little freedom session. Right? Be humble and gentle. Now, that doesn't mean be quiet and mousy. You can be bold and assertive. You can be confident. You can be you. Just be you, humble and gentle. Okay? Uh, be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Hurry up and change. <laughs> be patient with what each other. How do you maintain unity and fellowship? Be patient with one another. Why would you be patient? Because they might not be humble and gentle. So I've got to be patient with them. Because God's not done with them yet. So this person is not creating unity. And I'm about to kick them out. <laughs> Be patient with each other. Making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. It is your love that will cause you to be patient with them in their faults. And if you are not patient, you've got to do a love check. Am I loving this person or am I thinking about myself? If I'm, if I'm impatient with them, maybe I am in love with myself and not, I, and not loving them. So be patient with one another, making allowances for each other's faults. Because of your love. 
Now, don't be at fault, right? He's not excusing the faults of others. And he's not saying, be patient with me because of my faults. Make, you know, make allowances for my faults. He's not saying to the one who's making the faults that, hey, here's your excuse. They have to be patient with you. He's not addressing the fault maker here. If you are the fault doer, fault maker here, there's another message for you. Years will come later. But right now, this is the person who is impatient with the fault maker. Do you have someone in your life who you need to be patient with? Is there someone in your job, someone on your team, someone that you share a bed with at night, someone in your family, someone in your church, someone preaching the word to you right now? <laughs> be patient with them because of their faults. Guess what? We have them, and so do you. And you want to be treated with humility and grace for your faults, right? With, with your faults, not for your faults, with your faults. You want to be treated. You know the best way to be treated that way is to treat others that way. The best way to treat it, be treated that way is to treat others that way. You will reap what you sow. And if people are, are always rude and impatient with you, you might back up and say, you know what, I need to sow a little bit more patience and grace. Okay, so we, let's talk about other people, not ourselves. Uh, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Make every effort. Some of your versions would say endeavor to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavor, it's this Greek word skudezo, and it means, it's like be diligent. It's almost like saying strain every nerve to maintain unity. Whatever it takes to maintain unity, maintain unity. You press for it, you fight for it, you be patient for it, you love, you forgive, you, you have the hard conversations, but you, you sit there and you don't give up on that person and you don't give up on unity. Make every effort, strain every nerve to keep yourselves in the unity of the spirit, binding yourselves together in peace. If you bind yourself together, it means I'm tying myself to you, I'm connecting, I'm locking myself in with you. This is the unity that we want to feel and experience as a, the people of God. That's a prophetic statement to the world, because people will look at you and say, well, wait a minute, you guys don't have much in common. Oh, our past is so different, our experience, our education, our financial status, our leadership development, our... You know, all of these things, they might be so different. Our politics are different. Our sports teams are different. You know, all of these things are different. But man, we are straining every nerve, right? We are committed to the unity, to stick together in the spirit and the bond of peace, right? Tied together, we're committed to that. That's a statement. That's a statement. How can you guys love each other? And I know you don't see eye to eye on this other situation. Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about what he did for people who don't see eye to eye with him. The way he laid his life down and said, but I want you. I want you in my family. I want you there. He said, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. So attitudes and behaviors that gain and maintain unity or fellowship, it's humility, it's love, it's patience, it's gentleness. It's, it's a commitment to this. We gotta be committed to this. How else do we maintain it? When we make no place for disunity. The Bible is very, very specific on how do you deal with division? You know, division shows up in, in a lot of different ways. It doesn't just come up and say, you know what? You and you, right? <laughs> it's, it's not that. It, it shows up in, in, and it starts to creep up in little seeds, little cryptics, little, you know how I think they should have done it? You know, this, this shows up in your, your, your job. You got to watch this on your teams and don't get caught up with this stuff either. You know what the boss said, but what I think is, you know, they keep doing this thing, but not us, us and them. That's why, by the way, whenever someone comes who's part of our church says, hey, you know, at your church, I'm like, don't, don't we? I see you on Sundays. <laughs> Isn't this our church? I mean, I know my role in it, in it but, but this is our church, right? It's not us and them. And when you get in conversations at your job, us and them type stuff, starts to plant seeds, us and them. Organizations, groups that you're with, um, 
resentment, these are all seeds of division. And you got to be careful that, that you don't allow the place for them to get settled in the, the soil of your heart. Because if it grows up, it, it creates division. Scripture tells us in t t uh, Titus chapter 3, if people are causing divisions among you, give a first and a second warning. After that, have nothing more to do with them. For people like that have turned away from the truth and their own sins condemn them. That's strong language right there. I thought we just had to love everybody and make a you know, place for everybody. Everybody's welcome. We, yeah, everybody's welcome, wanted, loved. But division is not. Division is not. And there is a protection that is needed to protect you know, the unity. And he says, hey, give, be patient with them. Warn them, though. First time, second time. But after that, that's not okay. That is not okay. That is not okay. Why is that not okay? Because so much is at stake here. And division will steal that from us. And we will all miss out if we allow that, that division that spreads like this from maybe one or two people. We'll all miss out on what God has for us. And not only will we miss out, but those who are desperate to know Jesus will miss out too. There's too much at stake for us to give place to division. And the early churches are experiencing this supernatural unity, but it had to be maintained. And the Bible gives instruction on how to do that. But our hearts have to be willing, and we have to be committed to it. So this is what I want us to do. It's 12.03. I always break up and tell you, hey, you're done, you know, 12 o'clock. This is what I want us, I want us to do. I want us to take a couple minutes and, and address some of these questions. They're going to bring food out there. And, and um, some of you guys, if you got to go, I get it. 1203, the roast is in the oven. You know, you got to pull it out. I understand all that. <laughs> but this is a big part of our church, what we do right here, this conversation and connection. I want us at our tables or your chairs, maybe turn around and, and have this conversation. There, there's some questions that I'd love for us to talk through. Not everyone has to answer everyone. Maybe you won't get to all of them. But these are some good questions based on this. Why is unity so important? What attitudes or behaviors do you, have you seen that destroy unity? What's my part in keeping unity? What is my part? What can I do for this? And then pray for one another that you'd have a heart for unity as well. And if there's any other prayer needs that you, you have. But let's pray right now and then we're going we're gonna to break up into that and um, have those conversations. Jesus, you prayed that we would be one together like you are with the Father and that we would be one with you. Do that in our church. God, whatever it takes, that our hearts would be for that person around us, to love them, to see your purposes come to pass in their life. And the same in my own, in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's take a couple minutes here to have, have that conversation. The question up there is, is, what is my part in keeping the unity, right? So it's always exciting to talk about, yeah, these attitudes and behaviors of other people that uh, destroy unity, but, but my part. Hey, this is what I want us to do. Um, you're, feel free to stay at your tables and talk unless you got to get kids. we got food out on the table. You can grab food, come back to your tables, but make sure that before you do break up at some point that you ask if there's any prayer requests. And let's, we want ministry to be happening right there at these tables here, right there in your, your circles. So we love you guys. Keep the conversation going. Let's keep fighting for unity. Amen.